And uh, today I'm going to be interviewing Oliver Chittenden, who is the founder of Head Talks. Um, Oliver is actually also the director of the London Speakers Bureau, and he has been for 15 years. And he, he lines up speakers with big government and corporate events. So speakers along the lines of, you've had politicians, prime ministers, presidents, actors, actresses, mm. CEOs, like that, that sort of top level keynote speakers. Mm. So you've been doing that successfully for 15 years. Today, it's Oliver's chance to speak and to tell his story. And the angle I think is that's really interesting and I think you guys will understand and relate to is the idea that we all show a version of ourselves to the world, particularly in our careers, and there's usually another story going on underneath. So in Oliver's case, there was, you know, from the outside looking in, he had it all. He grew up in a castle in Ireland, right? Yeah. Yeah, sure. grew up in a castle, uh, was educated at Harrow, uh, had this fantastic and, and still very successful career. Um, he has a beautiful home in London. He has a beautiful farmhouse in France. He has a gorgeous wife. He's very wonderful and supportive. He's got a beautiful little girl. They have a baby on the way due like a month today. Yeah. So it's very easy to hear that story and think Oliver's got it going on. He's really successful. He's sorted. But what's really interesting is the, the other story, which Ollie's, Oliver's here to talk about today, um, which, and it's your story and your ability to begin telling your story really honestly and vulnerably to people, which was the beginning of your own healing of your own mental health journey. And it was the beginning of, of Head Talks, which is his not-for-profit online um, sort of digital platform where it's kind of opening up the conversation around mental health and kind of removing the stigma that's attached to mental health. So, should we get started? Yeah, definitely. I'm ready. Okay. That's an amazing okay. introduction. Um, I'll tell you the real me now. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Well, when, when did your journey with mental health begin? Where did, where did it begin for you? Yeah, I mean, I definitely, I was lucky. I had a pretty charmed upbringing, um, largely due to my mother remarrying very well, actually. My father was an alcoholic, so I lost him quite early on. Um, but nevertheless, I, I was brought up in a castle, and it was a very privileged upbringing. Um, we were sent, I had a twin brother, and we were sent off to all the posh, posh private schools. Um, and really, I, I was good at sports, very sociable. Um, you know, everything on paper seemed really well. And I, I remember having absolutely no sense of fear leaving school and, and through university and things like that. And I partied, and I was naughty, and I took drugs, and I did all those kind of things that a lot of us do. Um, but the key thing was, you know, I really felt the world was my oyster. You know, and I felt, you know, this is what I've been brought up to do. I'm going to go out there and achieve you know, big things. Um, and and that's, that's how I set out on my journey. And it was really um, sort of fast forwarding to the age of 27, I'm now 41, where typically with my sort of fighting spirit, I, I found myself opening um, a new office in, in Brussels. Um, we'd, I'd established the London Speaker Bureau in London and it was starting to go well. And I have languages, so I thought, you know, again, typical of me thinking, right, let's push this, let's keep pushing. Um, found myself in Brussels opening up the London Speaker Bureau office in Brussels. And I mean, the lead up to that, you know, there was no real signs of, of mental health. I mean, I didn't even know what mental health was, if I'm honest. You know, I was brought up in, a, in an environment where you were seen and not heard. You didn't talk about your emotions. Um, so I had no language or no skills, you know, it just wasn't part of my vocabulary. And um, I remember having a, a very fi a fi a sort of pinpoint back backache. Um, it was literally one where I could sort of put the f my finger on the pain, and I was convinced it must be something structural, you know, because I could so pinpoint this pain. And went to all sorts of specialists, and of course it, it, it was nothing. And you know, at the time I thought nothing of it. And then, whilst in Brussels and building this business, I suddenly started getting hit by these waves of, of anxiety. And they literally are waves. If you imagine the biggest waves 
that exist in the world, those pictures you see of surfers, you know, going on these waves. It's like being hit like that all the time. Um, the best way I can describe it is it's a bit like being on an aeroplane and you know when it suddenly dips down like that and your stomach jumps up into your, into your mouth. It's, it's like that feeling, but all the time. And so it just wears you down, wears you down, wears you down. And then, and then, and then the depression kicks in because you've been so worn down by this constant ravage of, of anxiety that just takes away your, your confidence, your sense of self-esteem, you know, your, your power, really, your internal power to, to, to operate. Um, and I think for me, you know, being, having been brought up the way I was and, and the way I sort of um, imagined myself or perceived myself, you know, I just, I just couldn't admit this to anyone. You know, I was like, right, I've, I, I started self-medicating. I started taking drugs, alcohol, anything to sort of bury the pain and I just pushed it down, pushed it down, pushed it down. And, um, you know, I was, often I would go back to London to see my friends and it'd be like Oliver the Conquering Hero, 26 years old, director of a company, doing well. And I didn't, you know, I didn't let on that, you know, there was this in huge internal pain going on inside me. Um, and, and I carried on like that for quite a while until I finally sort of took myself secretly to a psychiatrist. And I say secretly because I still think there's a sense that we failed if we go and see a therapist today. You know, there's still that stigma. It's like, oh, I must have done something wrong in my life if I go and see a, a brain doctor, let's say, or a psychiatrist or a therapist. And I remember going to see this guy, and I'll never forget him. He, he made me tick all the boxes. Back then it was a tick box scenario where you filled the questionnaire. And, and nowadays, I think about those questionnaires. I think most of us would probably tick all those boxes, even if we were sane, you know. Yeah. Um, and um, he said to me, look, you need to go to the Priory. You need, you know, round-the-clock surveillance. You need a whole army of people. We'll get you better. You know, we'll get medication and all of this. And then he said something really powerful, at what, which at the time I didn't, didn't take on board, which was, you know, your problem, Oliver, is that you're fighting. And I looked at him and I thought, you know, what do you mean? You know, how can you, you telling me to give up my fight? Uh, I just couldn't comprehend that, that logic, you know, because I'd always been taught to fight for the things I wanted in life. Um, and and it, it was just not in my DNA to, to th if I thought if I give up my fight, I might as well give up my life, take my life even. Um, and I ran out of that office, I booked a ticket to Australia, told no one, and I went on the run. I call it my year on, year on the run. And I won't take you into the whole gory story of that year, but essentially it um, ended up with me being picked up off a pavement in Sydney and shipped back to England to, um, to a treatment centre. And luckily for me, um, I have a very supportive twin brother, um, but also I still had insurance from my work, which was still in place. I was incredibly lucky, so I, I went into a treatment centre and I got the treatment that I needed and I was, I, I was a very good um, patient. I really wanted to get better and I think, you know, there is this sense of, you know, you often have to be brought to your knees before you actually ask for help. But it's actually at that point of putting your hands up is when the healing can begin. And I think, you know, today we need to really think about that and focus on this idea of prevention, especially with the young, to stop getting into this spiral you know, which I went through, because the longer you leave it, the harder it is to unravel. And a lot of people don't make it through. Um, so that's kind of, you know, um, my journey. And that's, that was my first uh, experience of depression, which came fairly late in life, actually, age 27. You know, often there's a, a history up to that point, you know, from, from bullying in school or, or other problems at home or abuse or relationship issues. Um, but no, for me, it was, a, it was a thunderbolt out of the blue, um, age 27. Which you originally completely ignored. Yeah. Then hit rock bottom. Yeah. To then go get help. Correct. So you had the help at this clinic. Yeah. And at some point you decided, well, I'm, I'm okay now, I don't need help anymore. I'm, I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm I did the therapy. I did, see, you know, the, the CBT, the medication was thrown at me. That was very much the standard approach, you know, and, you know, I've now completely changed my views on treatment services. I know we're not going to go on about the NHS or anything like that today, but, you know, I do feel that it's very archaic, it's very in need of innovation, and there are so many things that we can do to feel good about ourselves. And 
I think the important thing to remember is, is that we're all so unique in terms of where we get our inspiration or our sense of recovery from. It's not a one-size-fits-all approach. You know, it's, it's very much a, a pick and mix. You know, create your own toolbox, find, find out what, what, what works for you mm. and, and do those every week. You know, like you would go to the gym you know, to stay fit, we need to try and keep this fit. And there are a lot of practical things that you can do um, and as the narrative is changing from one of kind of stigma, which is still there, you know, I'm hoping we can now start really focusing on some of the practical things in the media that we can actually do to stay well outside just medication and CBT therapy. And you're going to share some of that with us in a little bit. Absolutely. Before we get to that. Yeah. So you had the therapy, you were feeling good, you took yourself, I think, off to France, you wrote two books met your wife, began having, you know, first child, everything was looking really good, and you felt recovered. But then what happened? Yeah, it was, um, so after my first kind of depression, it was a long journey out of it. I mean, it's not, it's not a light switch, you know, mental well-being. And because I'd left it and I'd buried it for so long, it took that amount of time to unravel it. So it's, it's very much a journey like that out of it. You know, it's kind of, building your mental resilience can, you know, I set myself a good two years to rebuild and there are knocks on that journey. But eventually you, you do build your resilience up and you get back to a sort of a, a better place. Um, but when that happened, I, I started to take a bit of a philosophical view, philosophical view on what had happened to me. In a way, I think it made me a more humbler person, a, a nicer person, um, a more connected person. You know, I think the relationships that I have with people are much more um, personable, you know, and much more real um, as a result of it. So I, I sort of, t you know, looked at it as part of my journey. It's happened, but I also knew intrinsically from the pain that I'd suffered, you know, and they say mental pain is worse than physical pain, and I absolutely agree with that. Um, I knew intrinsically that something, I needed to change something in my life. And being me, um, I went off to France and um, moved, moved myself to France, to the middle of nowhere. At the time, they were giving out mortgages to anyone. And uh, I, was, I was not, despite my wonderful introduction, I, I was not rich or, or, or famous or anything like that. I was pretty ordinary, um, but ordinary enough to, to get a 90% mortgage from a bank on a foreign property pre-2008, which is pretty unbelievable. And I turned up in this village in the middle of nowhere and, um, and settled in, and my friends were 80, 90 year olds, and they were like, what is this young Englishman doing here? You know, um, it's a very strange, strange occurrence. And, but it was a very happy time for me, because I kind of grounded myself, I re-identified re, re who I was and created a new identity for myself, you know, and I had a dog, and, you know, and I, I traveled a lot. I was still working with my speaker bureau, but just remotely. Um, and, and they were really good years, really great years. I got married, um, I had a, had a little girl, and we were, we were living the French life. And, and um, in many ways, I'd forgotten about my depression. And I, I definitely wasn't at every day using the tools that you know, I perhaps learned um, in my first instance with depression. And um, about 10 years later, I also wrote some books, and I always, out of every, I've only had two big episodes of depression, but something positive seems to have come out of both of them, and definitely getting married and moving to France and writing a couple of books. I did one book on inspiration and tried to understand what it is that inspires people rather than just talk about their amazing stories, actually trying to understand where their inspiration came from. And that was a real passion project, as is, as is Head Talks, which I'll talk about in a minute. But um, yeah, and I, I remember just one day, I remember it very, very clearly, a beautiful sunny day in France, and I was saying goodbye to, to my wife, and she had a friend staying with her, and I went to England, and it was to a funeral, so not, not, not the nicest of, you know, situation to go to, but bang, I was triggered. I was back in the panic attacks. I was back into that anxiety, and I was like, whoa, where did this come from? It was just like a sledgehammer. And um, I just couldn't believe it. And I, I hoped that it would just pass, you know, at, at, at the start. And I tried to start remembering my tools and some of the therapy. And it didn't. And um, it got worse and worse. And I struggled and struggled. And um, that must have felt really devastating. It was, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was so, it was really horrible. And 
you know, they often, it's off, I've learned now that, you know, a lot of people misinterpret mental illness in the sense that you just drop into a hole and pop out the other side. You know, it's often a lifetime of careful management, you know, to keep the so-called black dog at the back door, you know, not let him in, you know. Um, and it's a big misconception that, you know, that people have about mental illness. But lo and behold, I really realize that when it hits again, often it is harder than the first time, even though you can't imagine it could be any worse. Um, and I was so upset, I was so angry, you know, I wasn't on my own in my life. I had responsibilities, I had a child who was in a school, I had a wife who didn't speak French, who I needed to support, we were in the middle of nowhere. It wasn't like I could just up, up and go somewhere else, you know, it was, and, and so those pressures were a lot, lot, lot harder to, to live with whilst being not well. Now I was never someone who was totally crippled by depression, i.e you know, where I was under my duvet every day. I was always able to operate, and that was kind of my fighting spirit, if you like, as well. And I did therapy, I did Skype therapy. I thought, have I missed something here? Is there some trauma from my past that I haven't, haven't dealt with, you know? Mm -hmm. And I did the therapy, and I did all of this, and it went on for a good year and a half, and we decided to move back to London. And it was at that point where I sort of took quite a rash call, and I thought, I really want to throw the kitchen sink at this, and just try and get, get, get some sort of, just break this, this, this pain that was living with me. And I took myself off to the States. Um, I no longer had health insurance. And um, with health insurance, another big problem is if you're lucky enough to afford private health insurance, the minute you, you claim some sort of mental health issue, you're blacklisted completely. Um, so, you know, there's a whole, whole sort of fight that needs to happen there. Um, but I decided that I would take myself off to the States. Um, did this, when you took yourself to the States, did this feel like this is my last ditch yeah. effort? Like I've, I feel like I've tried everything, I've done everything, it's not working. This has to work. Did it <laughs> yeah, feel like I mean, it all it, or nothing? It, it, yeah, definitely. And again, mm. it's typical of my character to do an all or nothing approach. And I just wanted to throw the kitchen sink at it and just mm. see you know, if I could do something to try and break this pattern. You know. Um, and it was probably quite foolish um, and not thought out properly. But I, I clinged on to this um, through my speaking activities. I know about this lady called Brené Brown, who is um, one of the most viewed TED speakers. Uh, she's basically the sort of guru on vulnerability. And uh, I really recommend her books, actually, and at least watching her TED talk. Um, and I saw that she was running a, a workshop. She runs workshops in, in Tennessee. She's based at Dallas University. And I thought, right, well, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to, you know, go on this vulnerability journey and expose my pain. She talks about leaning into the pain. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm as vulnerable as I can be, so I'll just go for it, you know. And I, I went out there. Um, and um, it was hard for my wife to, to, to see me go. Um, but I was wanted to do it. I wanted to get away, f save them the pain of seeing me how I, how I was and, and try it out. So it was 30 days. and. It was intense, as Americans are, quite intense, very process driven, no phones, no TV. It was quite holistic, which I quite liked as well. Um, but what happened during that, that period um, of time was um, I got very ill physically <laughs> as well. So I was ill, Ill mentally, and um, but my, my organs started shutting down on me. Uh, it started with my kidney and then my bladder, my liver, my, my prostate, and I ended up in hospital in Nashville, really, really properly ill, um, and it was it was just very, very hard. I was on my own, but I remember thinking to myself on that hospital bed. I remember thinking, maybe, just maybe, this is what it's going to take to break this. You know, I was like, you know, bring it on. You know, let's let's see. Your body is um, like your last line of defense, isn't it? And yeah. it's almost like if you're not listening. To what, to where your healing is. And I know we're going to get onto this in a second, but when you, if you're not really listening to what you need to heal, your body's going to go right. Do you know what? I'm going to shut down, and then maybe you'll listen to me. That's maybe it. then I was really so take this caught seriously. up in my head, mm. you know, that I couldn't, I wasn't listening to my body. And I think looking back on it, it was my body's reaction to that kind of holding on for for those years. You know, it was like now just letting go, and um, and I cried and I cried. I learned how to cry and. I've never cried really in my life, you know, and 
now it's a major part of my own toolbox. It's actually a really um, important part of my toolbox. I get a huge sort of um, release of, of anxiety and pain, and it's, uh, it's, I find it very helpful having been very sort of blokish. I call it my man cry. In fact, the louder it gets, the better the healing. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, I did that. And, and, um, but I, again, I, I think at that time and that experience and coming back to my family, I was so broken. I was just so broken. Literally, I could hardly talk. You know, it was like I was so, so broken. But I knew again at this time that, that something good was going to happen out of it, that, that something out of the darkness was going to happen. And, um, and, and that's really kind of what happened. Slowly but surely, I started building my mental resilience. And, and that's what what gave birth to, to mind talk, to head talks. Yeah, but what you did was you went from that fighting attitude all your life fighting and striving and pushing and then with your managing your mental health it was fighting, striving, pushing to search for the answer, to get the solution, to do the work. And then you're I think it's really interesting actually that you were kind of brought to Brené Brown's work on vulnerability. Because within that was a little seed of a Oh, maybe that's maybe that's where my healing lies. Maybe it's in in being vulnerable and no longer fighting. And then when your body totally shut down and you were that sick, you were utterly vulnerable. And there was an element of surrender at that moment for you, wasn't there? So you went from really fighting to, okay, I really have to surrender now. And I think within the surrender was your freedom yeah, definitely. and your I mean, healing. Absolutely. I think acceptance for me was such a key word. Yeah. You know, I, I was no longer fighting. I, was like, I, I accepted that this was something mm. that I would have to manage. It could come again in my life, you know, in 10 years, three years, two years. But it was something I had to accept rather than push away. Um, and I think that that was, a, and it remains a really key point in my mm. recovery and in my toolbox so that, you know, when I do get anxious or I do feel depressed, you know, rather than just push it away I just kind of accept it you know I don't resist it and I think that's mm. really really important just to I always use the I have various analogies but it's like the bus analogy it's like as long as I'm driving the bus all the emotions can be passengers and they might try and get to the front and drive it but you know I'm in charge you know and they can come and flow in flow out um, but yeah acceptance was very key mm. very key for me and I've heard you talk about it was your crucible moment yeah, it was. I mean, in many ways, it was like something's got to change. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, we all get a big, big kind of wake up call when we get ill, you know, whether it's, you know, an, an illness or an accident or something like that. Something profoundly changes in us. Mm. Um, I've seen it in a lot of people. And um, for me, I didn't quite know what it would be, but I knew I knew something would change. Mm. So thank God for the journey that yeah. you've had, because at every stage of it, you learned different ways of coping with your own mental health. And through that, you created your own toolbox, and we're going to get to that in a minute. Yeah. Um, but through it, you realized, and this is what's so powerful about your story and what you're doing now with Head Talks, you realized that mental health isn't a one-stop shop. It's like, like There's not one fix for everybody. Mm. You have to create your own toolkit. That's it. Uh, I definitely... And you know, I, I, I learn, and I'm still learning, you know, I still yeah. learn, and one of the beauties of the journey I'm on with Head Talks is that I'm interviewing so many different types of people. I mean, I was interviewing a guy who's a specialist on kind of the impact of cold water on your mental health, Arctic water. You know, mm -hmm. swimming clubs are swelling up around the country, um, and it comes from Scandinavia and Switzerland, and, you know, and just, it's great to try these things out, and I, I'm trying to create this platform so that you know people can have access to some of the practical things we can do because I, yes i passionately believe that you know this idea that you can just address mental health with medication and cbt which is what we're getting from the nhs you know is just it's just not the right approach you know it, it needs to be we need to be offering a lot more variety in terms of what you can do because you know you can get as much inspirational sense of recovery from singing in your local choir than you can from taking a pill you know, it might be swimming in, in the cold ocean, acupuncture, you know, something more holistic like yoga or, or meditation. You know, there, there are lots and lots of things you can do and it's about just holding on to the things that make you feel good and adding them to your toolbox. Because quite frankly, 
you know, we all need a toolbox in 2017. It's chaos out there. You know, the digital world you guys know about, it's overwhelming. You know, we need to think about this. It's, it almost feels like we've gone into battle. We've kind of innovated and we've, we've gone so far down that journey. And we've dealt with the body, but we've kind of haven't had a plan B for the mind. We've kind of forgotten about the mind. And the mind is what makes you the best version of yourself. You know, it's the, it's the thing that gives you the best experiences, the best um, relationships, friendships. You know, if you're in a good state mentally, all those things are going to be better, you know. So, so yeah, I've got lots of views and I can gab, go on and on, but I'd love to show the... Um, yeah, why don't we take a look at the, the show, show reel, just to give you a sense of head talks and yeah. the journey I've been on. My 13th birthday, I thought that I would actually go out and give myself a birthday present that I wanted, and that was the first time I had sex at 13 with a 26-year-old man. And I didn't realise that that was abuse. I didn't have any alcohol, I didn't have any drugs, I didn't have any means of kind of numbing that anxiety and that pain and that adrenaline that I was feeling at the time, and I, I took a knife and I cut my chest open. It was like everybody in your life that you loved had suddenly all been killed and that was it. And it was like the world had almost ended. It's a car crash. It's going through the windscreen and lying in the middle of the motorway, not sure whether you can move your limbs. I actually totally had come to terms with the idea that it was fine to die. Um, I just thought, you know, I've done my best. Sorry, I'm feeling a bit emotional now. Uh, you know, I've had my children, they've got each other. You know, my husband can look after them. I, I actually, I can't go on. It's just pain, it's just too awful. And I really think looking back on it, that's really at that point when the recovery started, you know, because I wasn't fighting against myself. I asked myself a question, but whose words are they? And it's like, ah, because they aren't my words. They are words that were given to me as a child. And I realized, if they're not my words, then I can stop saying them. And I stopped saying them to myself. It was through talking about what I was feeling that actually helped me make sense of it. And turn into something, turn it into a strength as opposed to a weakness. you really got to look behind what's there and then create something new. Hence the need for acupuncturists, for yoga, for people doing EMDR, for rolfing, for all the things that people are looking for to kind of <laughs> cathartically get it out. So it's the intention that you put into talking, into the needle when it goes, when you apply it to the, to the body. If you've got cancer and you've had chemotherapy and your hair's all fallen out and you've got that kind of that look that people have people look at you and they know and we've developed the language to deal with that but when you walk down the street and you see somebody in emotional distress which I think you see more and more of we haven't got the language when you start to talk about these issues to groups of people there will be those who put their hand up and say actually yeah I felt that or I, I went through that um, and that actually is what Ollie's trying to do with Mind Talks, is to get people talking about it in order to build a community, to, 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 to get the issue out there and to get people realising that there is help and there are positive things you can do. Well, I think this is a fantastic initiative. It's, it's all about getting mental health out into the open, uh, normalising it in a way and uh, removing the, the, the mystery, the mystique and critically the stigma. There's nothing more that we could do in society that could have a bigger impact on the well-being of our, of our country than if we focus on mental health and, and stop the neglect of mental ill health. Hmm. How does it feel seeing that? Yeah, it's, um, Do you feel it's, proud? I do. I feel, I, it makes me feel quite emotional and just think how brave those people are to, to share their story. Um, but it also just, it just amazes me, you know, how much pain is out there quite frankly you know it's like you know if you can create the environments for people to share 
um, and to, to be honest, you know, with, with w what's going on in their lives, you know, it's a, it's a real privilege to, 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 um, to be able to have an impact and to, to see that shown, you know. Absolutely. It's amazing. So it was a seed of an idea. Yeah. And now it's a up and running, functioning, changing people's lives yeah. platform. Yeah. So can you describe exactly what it is? Sure. I mean, so I spent the last year and a half going up and down the country interviewing people. Um, I really, at the start, you know, I was freestyling it. I self-funded it, um, had no real support, didn't understand how a camera worked or editing or anything like that. Um, and I just went on this journey and I, I, I didn't, I wasn't entirely sure where it was going, if I'm honest. Um, but I knew that I wanted just to do this visually. I think, you know, there's so much out there that is very academic looking, scientific, very wordy online. And, and, and especially in alternative therapies, it's so vast and there's no real leadership in it. So you can get very lost as, as, as someone who's struggling. You know, you can spend a lot of money and a lot of time and often it can be too late to get to what you, what's gonna work for you. So I wanted to try and create a platform that brought all of this together in a sort of modern looking way um, in a visual way that, that you know, that, that people could, could sort of um, communicate easily via social media. I was very aware of the young and I wanted them to really understand this and to have a, a website where you weren't looking over your shoulder thinking, God, someone's going to see me on, my, on a mental health site. You know, mm. it's, I think the way the website looks, it's very fresh. It's, it's just lots of different people talking about the mind, really, um, from different angles. And it was astonishing how people would just drop drop in with, you know, I would be with academics, scientists, um, authors, and, you know, people with success stories, you know, and suddenly at the end of it, they'd say something like, you know, yeah, and I spent, you know, a year on the streets, or, you know, and my wife committed suicide then, and that was challenging. And so everyone's got their story, you know, and um, it, was, it was a beautiful journey. And I think one of the things that really bounced out at me was, was the feeling that there's a real feeling of disconnection um, in the world, actually. Um, it's, 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 uh, the irony being we've invented the internet to be more connected, but actually, I don't think we've ever felt more disconnected. Um, add on top of that, you know, uh, kind of the, this, this capitalist <coughs> drive that has really had a negative impact on community where you can get so much healing. And I, you know, they've done both done a lot of good things, the internet and capitalism, but there have been downsides and I think mental health has definitely uh, suffered uh, as a result of them. And, and it was really about giving access to lots of people, to lots of different things that they could do informing them, inspiring them, and educating people so that they could make their own choices, create their own head talks journey, and go back into their communities and they think, oh, I, I really resonated with what that guy said or that lady said, I'm gonna try that out. Or, yeah, that was really interesting about using poetry or gardening as my form of therapy. So I didn't really know at the start where it was gonna go, you know, but with my experience with the speaker network, I was quite. I was able to sort of network quite well, and and it was a sort of balancing act of who to interview, because although the big names are are you know are good because they create a bit of awareness, I was very conscious that I didn't want to create a kind of bandwagon for for celebrities. You know, I think there is a danger that depression is becoming quite cool now. You know, it's like yeah, I'm depressed. I'm cool, uh, and you know, I didn't want this site to be like that. You know, but. Um, at the same time, you know, it, it helps draw attention to it. So, but I also wanted people with lived experience because, and actually now that I'm able to sort of track where people go and what, what videos are most popular, you know, it's, it, the lived experience is still really powerful for people because it, it creates hope, commun sense of community, a sense of you're not, I'm not on my own having these thoughts. You know, I always say it's like we all have kind of battlefields going on in our minds, you know, in, in some in some shape or form, and um, just being able to, to, to give, give some air to that. Um, and lived experience, also where it's really helpful is that I, get, I say to people when I'm interviewing them, I just say, Let, tell me about the, the darkness, the pain, and then the, the journey out, the tools that work for you, and what you're up to now. And, and it's the tools, the variety of tools that people have used 
which are so helpful because you can learn from other people and if, if, if you connect with them then you can try their tools out just as you mm -hmm. can try someone who's a specialist on yoga and, and really focus on yoga. Mm -hmm. So it's bringing all that together in one place yeah. was, 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 was what, what I was trying to achieve. Yeah. But we're, we're sort of, you know, I'm, it's very organic, it's very, it's, it's moving, it needs to be like that, to sort of go with what people are after, and I, I've, I mean, I never had a Facebook page, you know, I'm coming to the you digital. You still don't have one. No, I'm coming to the, <laughs> the digital world very late on, but it's, it's a good, learning is a great, great thing for, for Oh, he did his first Facebook Live today. Yeah. Um, <laughs> learning and curiosity are, are very, very powerful things for keeping a healthy mind. Indeed. And... I've heard it said many times actually that having your own business is the best personal development journey you could ever take because you learn a hell of a lot about yourself in setting up your own entrepreneurial venture. What have you learned through setting up Head Talks? Which is such an inspired I think I'm action, just, I've, isn't it? I'm so happy to be doing something I'm really passionate about because mm. you know, it means so much to me and I think being able to contribute as well I've spent 18 years in the corporate world and, you know, even though the Speaker Bureau has a sort of soft sounding ring about it, it's actually very, quite aggressive world to be in. It's deal making and, you know, people are charging a lot of money and I'm dealing with lots of crooked politicians making lots of money. And, um, and I love it and it's been great and it's still part of my life, but it was, it's just so refreshing to be part of my tribe as well. Mm. You know, I feel like my work is like, linked to my well-being now which is which is a real relief to be honest you know and so and um, too, yeah and, and just creating that community and reaching out to people and, and it's been hard I mean you know I still have really hard days and I don't react well to stress and getting something like this launched is not easy you know and there's loads of challenges but just keep pushing I think when you've got a passion and you're you're on something you know even if all the walls are coming up just it's like a window of opportunity, just a little window opens up and you creep through and, and you're away again, you know, and um, it takes, yeah, it's, it's, it's been great. I'm, I'm just, the one thing I'm trying to do now is just step back and digest it, like, and, and really appreciate what I'm doing and, and, and um, kind of live, be present with it, because there's always so much to do in a startup, you know, especially totally. if you're on your own, well, driving it. you're full time with the London Speaker Bureau. Yeah. And this is, a full-time gig yeah, now. Yeah, it's more full-time. As yeah. well. Yeah. So I think that's probably a nice little lead in to your toolbox and how you're managing your mental health now yeah, because yeah. probably now more than ever you need it and you need to walk your talk, yeah. live that truth to yeah. keep inspiring other people and have this be an authentic venture. Yeah, definitely. So should we take a look at that uh, I think, slide yeah, I mean, that you've got on part your of own? The, how part you of the it? idea with, with Head Talks and we're still in a phase one approach and luckily we had funding from, from a foundation. It's completely non-profit, but we're now going to start going into corporates and doing workshops. But I'm hoping that people, I sort of have this vision that there'll be a basket, a bit like on Amazon, and you'll be able to drop your videos into it and create your own toolbox. And we'll be able to actually give people a real journey through, through head talks. But this is, this is what works for me. I mean, you know, as I said earlier, we're all so unique. And I think whether we do it consciously or unconsciously, we all do things to keep us on the level, you know, even if we're not in talking mental health, you know. So I have to go to the gym on a Monday morning. That's just something I really try and do. I actually need to go three times a day. Um, I also, I love kicking the shit out of a punch bag, you know, because that releases a lot of my anxiety and stress. Um, you know, good sleep is just crucial. You know, it's like, that's just like, I stopped drinking last year. I love wine, but it just started affecting my sleep, you know, and, um, and so that I just woke up too many mornings thinking I can't feel like this anymore, you know, so I, I gave that up. I'll have a beer occasionally still, but, but um, you know, the, the party days are, 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 are waning. Um, I also, um, I love sunshine, massage, spa, those are all luxuries that I, I do occasionally. I meditate every morning for 20 minutes, that's something I do religiously. Meditation is probably the biggest gift I've given myself. And it's, it's not easy to get into, there's loads of apps, it's a very personal journey like all these things are. Um, 
but it's really, really helped me. Um, I, I actually have someone I know, um, so I went to various retreats and I follow him and I have, you know, I have a, a, um, a recording that I listen to in the morning and it's just, it's just vital for me. Um, allowing myself a man cry, you know, that's been huge for me. It's, it's almost like I drop into like the, the victim and I say, you know what, I'm really pissed off. I'm so fed up with having to manage this, this, this mental health issue, you know, it's like, and I, I'll watch a, a video of my daughter or a really sad talk on, on the internet just to get the, or a really sad movie, just to get the kind of the emotions going and then bang, I'll let it out. It sounds a bit like a machine gun. And it's, 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 it's brilliant and it just, it resets me. It just completely resets me. And I only realized that age 40, talking, 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 honestly, I always challenge myself to be as honest as I possibly can. Um, and then obviously the mindful thing, you know, is linked to the meditation. But it, it is as simple as, you know, recognizing the blossom out there, just stopping, taking a different work to root, a different route to work, just changing things a bit. You know, I often find having a cup of tea or an apple or a raisin just to, you know, smother the senses. You know, often if you're kind of going round and round in your head, if you can just smother one sense, like, for me, you know, loud music in my ears can kind of drown out the voices. Or you can buy like eucalyptus, you know, and you can inhale it and just so the sense of smell and it just kind of clears the head. Um, and, and, and so those are just little, little sort of mindfulness things that I do. Um, and yeah, and just exercise is key. I know everyone says it and it's quite boring, but it, it really is very, very important. So it's not rocket science, all of it. Um, but it, it's what works for me, and but I'm still trying things. I mean, I'm, I was talking to this cold water guy, you know, who goes, he's been for 13 years, he swims every day in Brighton in the sea, and he was telling me about the community that meets every day at 7 a.m. It's people with arthritis, with no legs, but, you know, this cold water is having a huge impact on them. And I've been sort of looking up, um, you know, where these, these outdoor swimming pools are. So I'm still learning, and I still try things out mm -hmm. as well. Do you think the most watched video is? Um, the most watched video, I think, what's been interesting is um, the men actually, because mm. I think you know men, we've kind of bred this, you know, historically the man's gone out and has you know brought brought in the food and delivered and you know gone out and done the job and you know even we, we talk about manning up and you know the man being being the, the you know the the strength in the family and I think you know you look at male suicide rates and it's really really worrying it's I think outside car crashes it's it's the biggest killer you know of young men and um, because you know it's hard for a man to come forward um, and, and talk about his emotions and I think there's an amazing story of, of Johnny Benjamin who is the man on the bridge guy I don't know if you guys know about him but he he um, he was about to commit suicide off London Bridge and a passerby came and talked him out of it and then he spent kind of seven four or I can't remember how many years trying to find the passerby and um, they've linked up now and they tell their story but also really successful people like Simon Woodruff the founder of Yo Sushi you know millionaire in his own right lives on a houseboat on the Thames you know sit, hearing him talk about how he prays with his wife every morning by his bed you know and, and um, you know his problems with depression and, and addiction you know, very humbling, and then even Nick Love, who's like this, you know, from a, a, a council estate in the East End, who's a quite a quite a big film director. He does very hard edge films on football hooliganism and things like that. And him talking about how he goes to boxing and just breaks down in tears because mm. of this release. You know, it's very powerful. Mm. Those kind of stories. Um, you have to go and have a look. I mean, uh, it's there are lots. Again, it's unique. You know, it's like what does it for you? Mm. The lived experiences mm. and the ordinary folk as well are equally powerful. Mm. Um, but I hope, you know, whenever I sit down with someone, I say, you know, if you want to swear, cry, laugh, you know, just just make it real, you know, and take us on that journey. Yeah, yeah. I find it really, really touching and very powerful when you say so kind of casually how you'll have a good man cry or that you'll need to box or you'll just need to express emotion and how important that is. I think most men, I don't know if any men in the room can relate, but most men are not okay mm. with having that conversation mm. or even, even 
considering that conversation, considering being emotional. Mm. So you doing that, I think, is really important. Hmm. Do you wish something like Head Talks existed for you about 10 years ago? Is that, was that a motivation to create it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, God, I was lucky 10 years ago. You know, honestly, I was in such a bad way. I was, you know, I was on an addi- on, I started on an addiction unit because I was so heavily, you know, self-medicating and then depression. And, you know, I could easily have, you know, I could easily have died, if I'm honest. You know, I, I really, could, my life could have not, not turned around. And I just, you know, the stigma of mental health, you know, was so strong then and I had no tools. Um, and, and I just, yeah, I, I wish it had been around. And, mm. and in fact, on the stigma thing, you know, what we can actually do a quick test because it is still very, very alive. It's, it's, it, if you just all like to stand up, just really quickly, I know it's boring, but if you all just stand up. Um, and if you just like, if you stay standing, like if you've had a mental illness or a family member has, um, you know, it could be addiction, bulimia, depression, anxiety, you know, just, just stay standing, basically. And then, and then, and then, I want you to to stay standing if you've actually been able to talk openly about having one of these conditions, or to a fam, or a family member. So, if you have been able to talk about it. So, actually, it's quite interesting. So that the stigma is still very prevalent. You know, we've kind of seen it here. You know, there is still a stigma around mental ill, Ill health. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, it's not just a privileged background. Sit down, everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not just a privileged background. You know, factory workers in the north, you know, they're not going to go and tell their bosses or their parents about, you know, feeling depressed and things like that. You know, it's, it's across, across the board, you know, Winston Churchill, you know, Abraham Lincoln. I mean, there are many, many examples of it, you know, from the arts and things like that. So mm. it's, you know, it is something that's very prevalent. That was amazing. Only two people weren't standing at the first question. Mm. Have you ever experienced any level of mental yeah. health issues, illness? I think this is it. It's Pretty like, much the entire room was standing. I think it's that human condition thing that we need to, to realize is that we all have varying degrees of mental health. You know, it's like we mention mental health and we almost automatically think that equals illness. It's actually not. It's just different levels of it. So if we can learn how to, like, stay resilient, to keep our resilience going, because there are going to be challenges in all our lives, mm. but it's just being able to lean on the things that work for us to rebuild when we need to mm. and uh, to be able to cope in a pretty, you know, we need to be adapting with the times. You know, we need to, we've left the mind behind. So this is your personal toolbox, but you have a toolbox for so yeah, to I share just, with everybody. This that is might just be like helpful. a very so um, overview. Oh, this is something I say, um, but that that I always say. There's no magic pill, otherwise I would have found it. Um, but if you go on to the next slide, so it, it's not again, it's not complicated stuff, but it's just things to kind of think about to just to. to you know, you can read that and... Um because I think what you're about, Oliver, is not having people hit rock bottom before they seek help. Right? Yeah, I it's think It's about, that's I mean, the reason why you've got Head Talks, the reason why you're showing this slide, is because you kind of want people to... You want to alert them to getting conscious to, oh, maybe, maybe there's something on the way for me here. Maybe mm. I'm, I'm heading, like I'm sliding down to a rock bottom if I don't do anything mm. about it. I think there's that, and there's you also to... actually what's interesting, I think e- equally interesting, is actually I could feel a lot better than I do right. if I just try that out. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. We, we're sometimes living on a level, and we think, oh, I'm, I'm okay, and I'm all right with this. But actually, Fine. you go and dive yes. in, the, you know, in the Arctic Ocean, you think, God, I feel brilliant. You know, and you're, you feel 20% better. Well, it's it's like, why wouldn't... It's surviving to thriving. Yeah. Like, why not? Yeah, it's like, you know, why not try things out that could make you feel a lot better? Do you know what I mean? But absolutely, the prevention thing is, is key. And it's like, mm. you know, and, and it's a really exciting time for mental health now because mm. the stigma, the lid is lifting slowly, you know. And, um, but we're just so behind in terms of what we give people, mm. you know. And... Um, it's it's in massive as i said earlier it just needs to be re rethought through re-innovated i mean you go to the scandinavian countries and the way they're leading their health 
not only their health services but their societies. You know, the, the focus is much more on community, on happiness. You know, some countries have ministers for, for happiness now, you know, um, and I think it's great, you know. And I was actually at a conference recently with a former prime minister of Finland, a guy called Alex Stubb, and unlike most uh, former prime ministers, uh, he actually will only speak about happiness. He doesn't want to talk about politics. And um, it was amazing hearing him talk, talk about mm. this and how, how this should be you know, front, front, front topic yeah. on the top, you know, in, in government. Totally. So, totally. so what's next? Where are you taking it now? So just Before keep, Q&A. Just keep, keep, keep working. Yeah, just Head Talks is just going to keep going. I mean, follow the journey. We want to take people on more, more of a journey. But um, yeah, if anyone's got any questions while I'm here, please feel free to ask. F feel free to to ask any questions you you like. Um, yeah. It's pretty interesting hearing about your journey, and you know, you talked a lot about not almost overachievement, but like that real pushing. Um, and I wondered how you approach your work now like post you know your healing do you feel that you take a different approach and cause I guess there wasn't lots on your toolbox around how you work and I just thought I mean I've also kind of come from a background of like working really crazy hours and then from coming to Google trying to readjust yeah. but I can still find I have a tendency to want to do too much yeah. or to keep up with my peers so I just thought it'd be interesting to hear if you've got any tools around kind of work-life balance yeah, no, I mean, it's, uh, you know, I get caught up in it like everyone else still, you know, and I, you know, I, I get overwhelmed and uh, I get stressed um, and I don't stop enough, you know. Uh, I, I've learned to kind of digitally detox a little bit. Um, so I really kind of set, set times around when I turn my phone off, when I get home and when I turn it on in the morning. Um, there's actually some scientific proof that shows that dopamine is released when you receive messages. You know, you actually feel excited because someone wants you and is like sending messages, you know. So there's this addiction, almost like smoking. You know, I'm sure they knew about that before they invented all these things. But um, so it's creating some control over the digi digital side of things. And that's I've actually done a talk on digital detox, got an expert in to, to do a talk on that. Um, and it's just taking myself out of my head and in onto the tennis court, um, into the spa, into the gym, um, spending time with my family, you know, and, and, and but being really disciplined around the digital for me is, is massive. Um, you know, again, mindfulness, meditation, that's a really personal mom moment of my own to cherish, you know, of peace and quiet. Thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that. Have a have a great day.